a rugged yet beautiful landscape in the heart of Europe, formed by water, ice and rocks. A valley hidden deep within the Swiss Alps. The Engadin is one of Switzerland's best kept secrets. A valley shaped by the River Inn and guarded by mountains on all sides. Gigantic glaciers straddle the peaks, the enormous force of flowing ice constantly carving out new paths. This barren wilderness is a last refuge for many alpine specialists. The Engadin safeguards the future of some of Europe's most iconic animals. At over 2,000 meters, the Lungin Pass and Lake is the site of Europe's Great Continental Divide. A drop of rain that falls here has an uncertain future. If it falls into the lake, it's the start of a long journey down rivers heading east towards the Black Sea. Falling on the northern side of the pass, takes it down the River Rhine all the way to the North Sea. And the southern side of the ridge will take it south through Italy's lakes and rivers to the Mediterranean. From these high alpine peaks, water drains in all three directions, carrying a little part of Engadin to the distant corners of Europe. And it carries with it a secret message. The Alps are particularly sensitive to climate change and global warming has an immediate and striking impact on the water cycle. In winter, water travels up the mountainsides as snow and ice, forming vast glacial reservoirs for decades to come. Located in the remotest part of Engadin is one of Europe's oldest and Switzerland's only national park. Untouched by man for over a hundred years, the landscape has reverted to the hand of nature. Flocks of tiny birds seek safety in numbers and congregate in a large tree beneath a red crossbill. There's food and shelter to be found here. In the depths of winter, a willow tit and a yellow hammer pick out tiny insects from under the bark. The high vantage point and the many watchful eyes provide safety from predators. first sign of danger, they scatter. Chamois mountain goats have always been here. Bearded vultures have returned to the skies above Engadin. With a wingspan of nearly three meters, they're the largest birds in these mountains. They're scavengers searching for animals that have succumbed to the cold.
A pregnant chamois struggles up the steep slopes. And for last spring's young, this winter is the first test. There's little food to be had now, and the chamois may go up to two weeks without feeding. But there's an upside to the deep snow. The treetops and their succulent shoots are much easier to reach. Winters are long and severe in Engadin, six months at minimum. Red deer have moved into the valleys below the tree line. With the arrival of spring, last year's young will need to become independent. Their mothers are pregnant again and will have no more time for them. The females keep their eyes peeled for exposed patches. Shifting slabs of snow are a deadly danger, but they often reveal the only source of much needed food. The stag rests nearby. Hard winters bind the herd. There'll be no rivals now. The majestic peaks of the Engadin seem inhospitable to all life. But there is a creature tailor-made for this landscape. The alpine ibex is a wild goat that's adapted to the high mountains. It seeks out the rocky terrain above the tree line, feeding on the exposed slopes. Only in winter will it venture down into the lower valleys. After an avalanche, it's particularly tricky. Special techniques are called for. It isn't for everyone. Unfazed by height and sheer drops, the ibex can't handle unstable surfaces. And at 100 kilos, her weight doesn't make it any easier. Navigating through fractured snow uses up valuable energy. So in winters with heavy snowfall, ibexes leave the safety of the national park and seek out neighboring valleys with less snow. Until a hundred years ago, man was the worst enemy of the ibex. Once widespread throughout the Alps, by the end of the 19th century, ibexes were hunted almost to extinction. Surprisingly, it was a royal Italian hunter who saved the species. It was in the Aosta Valley, on the slopes of Mont Blanc, that King Victor Emmanuel II, nicknamed Re Cacciatore, the Hunter King, inherited a piece of perfect ibex country. He pronounced it his personal hunting ground. There were only a hundred ibex left, but his gamekeepers protected them fiercely. Fighting on the steep, rocky slopes is a dangerous business, so males determine their hierarchy through harmless tussles throughout the year. Today, the King's Hunting Ground, the Gran Paradiso, is a national park and safe haven for the ibex. But the iconic mountain goat is also found in other parts of the Alps. And this is down to the efforts of two determined Swiss men. Italian poachers played an important part in the story, for the king refused to sell a single one of his precious animals. 
not even to ensure the conservation of the species. If caught, the poachers risk execution. <laughs> Under cover of darkness, the live cargo was shouldered in crates or baskets along the steepest mountain passes. The secret operation often took weeks. But it was a risk worth taking. The Swiss buyers would pay today's price of a mid-range car for a single kid. To feed the kids, twice a day, domestic goats were strategically positioned along the route. In those days, goats were often left to graze beside fields and meadows, so they didn't attract attention. The kids were taken from their mothers immediately after birth. Keeping them alive was difficult. Not all of them made it. Over time, the poachers established a network of caves and huts along the way providing much needed shelter from the elements and the police. Once across the border, the smugglers were hailed as heroes. Their precious cargo was destined for a wildlife park in the little hamlet of St. Gallen. Its founders, Robert Marder and Albert Giotana, set up a program with government support to reintroduce the Ibex to Switzerland. All told, 59 Ibexes were smuggled over the border, making the poachers very rich. Today, there are over 40,000 Ibexes in the Alps, all of them of Italian descent. Robert Marder was one of the first to invest his own money in conservation, money he'd made in Engadin's flourishing tourist trade. Snow polo on Lake St. Moritz has existed as long as the National Park. It's an eccentric pastime for the wealthy, but it has indirectly helped wildlife conservation in Engadin. The Swiss National Park was created in Engadin in 1914 the very first in the Alps. The aim was to leave 170 square kilometers untouched forever and to let nature take its course. With no threat from hunters, the chamois have little to fear. Their padded, flexible hooves make for sure footing all year round. The color of their coat provides good camouflage in the springtime. The gazelles of the Alps can reach speeds of 60 kilometers an hour. As winter nears its end, the chamois seek out fresh grazing further down the slopes, where spring arrives a little earlier. 
Seasons here are about place, not just time. The young learn what they can and can't eat by watching their elders. Bearded vultures once had an undeserved reputation for carrying off lambs. By 1890, they'd been wiped out. A hundred years later, once again, crates are being carried across the border. This time, not by poachers, but by researchers from the Vienna breeding station who are bringing two young vultures to a temporary nest. At 90 days old, they still have their black juvenile plumage. In another month, they'll be ready to fly. Until then, they must get used to their new surroundings. Reintroducing the bearded vulture is Engadin's second great success in the conservation of species. These young vultures had a helping hand into life, but now they must survive on their own without parental guidance. first youngster takes to the air. Like all birds, they have a natural ability to fly. But practice makes perfect. In the Serengeti of the Swiss National Park, the steep valleys provide perfect flight conditions. At nearly seven kilos, bearded vultures need a lot of energy to get airborne. But they can always count on a thermal for extra lift. In the 15 years to 2007, 26 bearded vultures were released here. And that year, the first breeding pair was seen in the National Park. With vast territories averaging 500 square kilometers, Bearded vultures can only be introduced via an international program like this one. The Plaisir Alpine pasture lies right on the edge of the National Park, close to one of the vultures' nesting sites. The sheep have nothing to fear from the bearded ones, but there's another newcomer here. In 2008, a wolf was sighted for the first time. And wolves need a year-round supply of sheep to survive. A remarkable dog in sheep's clothing as the best defense. Pure white Marmano dogs were first bred in the Abruzzo region of southern Italy. They're born in the pen amongst the sheep, so they feel like members of the flock. Their task is to be vigilant. Gathering and moving the herd is the job of border collies, miniature wolves in dog's clothing. Their instinctive skills in sheep management have a lot in common with wild wolves' hunting behavior.
Border Collies are said to have what's called sheep sense. They can predict what the sheep will do next. That helps them keep the flock together, while the Marimanos simply run alongside and watch. Much of the time, they disappear into the herd, barely distinguishable from their companions. They're saving their strength and energy for protecting the flock in an emergency. But at the end of the day, he comes into his own. As night falls and the fog rolls in, the Marimanos take up their positions as guard dogs. This is the hour of the big predators. In 2014, a brown bear was spotted on these pasture lands. It killed three sheep in a little over a week. The dogs instinctively form a defensive wall between the flock and approaching danger. But experienced predators know these tactics. They approach silently under cover of night and fog. The following morning, a Marimano takes stock. This sheep wasn't killed last night, but it's a sure sign there's a killer about. The return of the big predators has awakened ancient fears and prejudices. There may be compensation for any loss, but that won't appease every farmer. Slowly, spring returns above the tree line. Water rushes down the mountainsides. Water, the lifeline of alpine pastures, the basis of sustainable agriculture. But traditional alpine farms are fast disappearing, forced out by changing lifestyles. Marmots don't care who grazes here, livestock or wild animals, as long as the grass is kept at just the right length for their dinner. After six months hibernation, it's time to wake up and clear up. These young males are rehearsing the defense of their burrow. They're also establishing their place in the group. With only the alpha pair breeding, competition is high. Some take a little longer to get moving. While the female cleans, the male keeps an eye on things. 
But these traditional roles are not quite what they seem. In Marmot society, males and females are equal, and both will fight to protect their territory. A neighboring male approaches with dishonorable intentions. Only a male can see off a male intruder. The profusion of wild flowers in alpine meadows is a direct result of intensive agriculture. As more and more pasture land is turned over to grazing by wild deer, the variety of plant life may even increase. But the vibrant flowers that attract human ramblers and insects may disappear. And this, in turn, has an effect on the insect life. Does a fly know it has chosen a rather rare Nigritella orchid for its metamorphosis? A beautiful starting point for this short life. The picture is always changing, whether pastures are fertilized by a farmer's cattle or trimmed by grazing deer. The change itself can be delightful. The decisive factor is time. Engadin is a dry alpine valley. The surrounding mountains shield it from rain in all directions. Yet, under special conditions, gifts from far away reach this secluded mountain region. And then, the glacier ice turns the color of chamois. It's the color of Africa. Sand from the Sahara Desert, carried thousands of kilometers by the winds over land and sea, up into the mountains, comes to rest on glaciers at 3,000 meters. Mountain lakes, called blue eyes, see the world in a very special way. They register geological messages from the depths, as well as every tiny particle the winds carry across the globe. Water is planet Earth's most sensitive organ where everything becomes visible. Traces of human activity are measurable, even at 3,000 meters. Water mirrors the mountains, the heavens, nature, the whole world. It's midsummer and red deer are grazing freely in the open in the middle of the day. Living within the safety of the national park has made them confident and less wary of humans. The young stags congregate in their own bachelor groups. In the long, warm days, they play fight and test each other's strength. There are no conclusive outcomes, no real foes. It's not compulsory. Some prefer to graze.
no one's injured in this four-leg strutting. And the females don't deign to watch. Several times a year, the park rangers check the numbers. They've recorded the movements in the park for a hundred years. From the beginning, the scientists have asked the same questions. How will nature evolve if man doesn't intervene? How does wild behavior change when human civilization withdraws? Regular counts of red deer are a major task. So as not to count the same animal twice, the rangers stay in close communication. They divide the area into sectors and note the individual characteristics of each animal. Red deer often move between valleys, so regular monitoring is the only way to get reliable data. This is also the country of Heidi, the world's most famous shepherd girl. But who would expect serenity and peace in this rugged landscape? But Ibexes know how to pass their time at ease. Next door, they're learning by doing. Vital skills need to be acquired. Under the watchful eye of a governess, the young males go through their paces on a perpendicular rock face. Talents inborn. It still needs practice. Today, it's hard to believe the Ibexes were once on their way to extinction. In the local Romance language, the name means that forest back there. It's the highest Swiss pine forest in Europe. The giant trees of Tamangur can live 800 years. No other trees can survive up here in winter temperatures of 30 degrees below zero. The spotted nutcracker eats the pine tree's oily seeds, so it was long considered the pine's worst enemy. In fact, the forest needs the nutcracker to grow. These trees survived the Little Ice Age, as well as our own brief warm period. But they can't reproduce easily. Thank you. 
The nutcracker needs about 80% of the seeds it takes to get through the winter. The rest remain hidden in the ground where he left them. There they have the chance to become a new tree. So the nutcracker is really the pine tree's greatest ally. When an ancient tree at last falls to the ground, it's left where it lies. So the natural cycle can continue over generations. At every stage of its life, the Swiss pine is a source of new energy. For centuries, the tree's unique qualities have been used in medicine. Swiss pine brandy is famous too. This small stand of ancient trees, safe within the national park, sometimes welcomes a shy and elusive visitor. The lynx. The wildcat has made a comeback in the Alps in the last 30 years, but it's still rare today. The robin's red breast looks surprisingly yellow, maybe because of a carotene deficiency at high altitudes. No more than a morsel for a large cat, but the lynx has broad tastes and small birds are definitely on the menu. A lynx is cautious when selecting a home territory. He has high expectations of a habitat, but he'll hunt anywhere. Like most predators, he prefers to stay hidden, so he avoids open spaces and human settlements. Switzerland has been successful in reintroducing the lynx, but only in a very limited area. To bring the lynx back permanently, large interconnected territories are needed. And most of all, other lynxes. Undisturbed forests of Engadin, with their abundance of wildlife, should be the perfect lynx habitat. What's missing is company. In 2008, a lynx captured in the park was fitted with a transmitter. It stayed for a few months before moving on to neighboring Italy, probably in search of a mate. If the lynx is to come back to the Alps for good, existing populations must have the chance to come together. The roar of the dominant stag echoes through the valley, declaring ownership of his harem. Young males are chased away.
A sudden flurry of snow puts a temporary end to the excitement. It's only mid-September, but early snow is not uncommon in Engadin. One young male is not giving up. But the reigning stag is quickly on the scene again. He has to work hard to keep his females in line. This is the call of a more serious contender. He's also attracted the attention of the females. It's a confident approach. The females are still interested. It's clear this is a serious challenge. The two stags are now locked in a vocal duel. But that won't be enough to resolve the issue. Sensors come into play. The challenger can smell the aggression. In the end, there's only one option. like this can last well into the night. Body weight and strength will now determine who wins. This time, the stag could see off his rival. Next time, who knows? A bearded vulture revels in its newfound freedom. Two more bearded vultures were introduced in 2014, and eight chicks hatched in the wild. Ten new arrivals in a single year. The Swiss bearded vulture population has reached a sensational high. A parent and youngster ride the thermals together, the young bird learning from the experienced adult. and it's about to get one of its most important lessons. The adult is carrying a bone in its talons. It seeks out a rocky slope and then circles at just the right height. Into position, and the bone drops.
The bone has shattered and the bird can get at the nutritious marrow. Is this a male or a female? You can't tell from the beard. The young vulture watches from above. He's going to need a lot of practice. Like other vultures, bearded vultures are scavengers, always on the lookout for a carcass. But they just take what all the others leave behind. This time, it's the youngster's turn. The drop may have been hesitant. But the landing glide is assured and confident. The elder keeps a watchful eye from above. The youngster seems unsure where the bone has landed. He's found it, but it hasn't cracked. He'll have to try again. Up to 40 times to break one bone. goes again. A young bearded vulture can take up to seven years to master this skill. Feathers along the wings act like flaps on an aircraft, fine-tuning the bird's descent. Perfect. With their diet of bones and bone marrow, bearded vultures occupy a niche without competition from other scavengers. And they benefit from other birds of prey by cleaning up their leftovers. Efforts to reintroduce the lynx and the bearded vulture to Engadin show that protection alone is not enough. International agreements and safe wildlife corridors are needed so that animals can move freely and build up sustainable populations. But the Swiss National Park has proved that pristine wilderness can exist in Europe with human intervention. And that makes this ever-changing oasis a vital alpine success story.